Ah, uh, geek out. You one of the best. You got me instead. That's right. It's another episode of Kiss My Podcast. Today, we're talking all about Creatures of the Night from 1982. We're bringing back an old friend, which is to say the guy from the last episode, Mr. Christopher Schwartzlander. What's up, man? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah there it is. Um, yeah, man. Like I said, we had a great time talking about one of the worst albums ever made with music from The Elder. And I remember when I talked to you, you jumped. You were like... I'm going to jump on that music from the other grenade, but I'm also, I got to talk about Creatures from the Night, and I'm like, you're in, man. Oh, absolutely. Creatures of the Night is uh, <laughs> one of the definitive Kiss albums. I'm glad, um, I'm, I'm glad to hear it, man, because I, I, love, I love having people on who's like, either, either if you love the album or you hate the album, I love having either of that on there, you know? I think we were both on that for Music from the Elder, and I'm glad to have oh, yeah. you on for, for this, for Creatures of the Night, because I like, I like your passion, you know, and I, we've been talking... Um, in between recording episodes that you've been like, you know, just gearing up, ready to talk. So I'm, I'm ready to jump in this. Um, but let me go over a, qu- a couple of the quick notes here real quick before we go in, give you some background to all the Absolutely. listeners out there of what's going on in Kissland. The crazy thing is Chris reminded me uh, via Facebook today that this was recorded, uh, released, I'm, I'm sorry, released October 13th, 1982. Now, we are rec- we, this is going to drop on Friday the 14th. We are recording this on October the 13th, 2016. How crazy is that? That's that's insane. It just it just happened to that's be kismet. yeah. It just happened to be in the thirty fourth anniversary of Creatures of the Night. Um, it was recorded July to September nineteen eighty two at the Record Plant Studios, Los Angeles, California. Produced by Michael James Jackson. No, not Michael Jack. Well, I guess technically Michael Jackson, but not the Michael Jackson you're thinking of. Um, not the he. he yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. He was too busy. Uh, I guess doing Thriller or getting ready to do Thriller. Um. And then uh, Paul and Gene actually helped produce on this one as well. Uh, we got three singles. I Love It Loud, October 13th, 1982. Although in my notes, I wrote 1892. Um, Killer, November 1982. Uh, and Creatures of the Night, April 1983. Um, so we'll jump into some background here. And Chris, feel free to hop in because I know you've been you know, really looking over this album left and right. If you have any information as well, you want to pop in before you go track by track. Um, but basically, the band at this point is trying to find themselves after the disaster that is Music from the Elder. Um, and unlike Music from the Elder, this is the album where they're like, we're going to go back to our roots. And one of the ways they do that is by sonically hitting you over the head with distortion and big drums for the entire album. Um, and we get that on the first track. Um, the sad thing, though, Ace fans, he's in this one name only, name and credit only. Um, and and that, is, that, is, that is so sad. It is very sad. He is on the cover but he does not play a single note on the album, and we won't hear from him again until the reunion tour in 96, which is, which is sad, but we'll get there. That'll be way down the line. Um, I, like I said, it's sad to say goodbye to my favorite member, but uh, like I said, he'll be back. Um, interesting note, though, during this time, Eddie Van Halen offered his services to join KISS um, and was declined by Gene Simmons. So I don't know. Gene, Gene, Gene. Mean Gene. I don't, could you imagine uh, uh, KISS with Eddie Van Halen on lead guitar? That would have been such a weird, um, <laughs> yeah. It, I don't think it, sound. it it wouldn't have fit well because again, Kiss is more like Van Halen. Definitely is like dirty rock and roll, but like yeah. Kiss has never been like the noodly guitar stuff. Like Ace is a very classic uh, lead guitar player. Now the funny thing is, the guy that they do get, Mister Vinnie Vincent, is a bit like Eddie Van Halen in terms of soloing. You know, he is a noodler. He is like the finger tapping, yeah. and he'll play a million notes a second. Um, I, I think I've referenced this before, maybe on this episode, or not on this episode, on this podcast, maybe on the Geek Out show um, by itself. But there's a great YouTube video some compiled of all the lead guitar players of Kiss all playing the Love Gun solo. Um, and wow. so you get to hear the differences in each one because that's such a classic running up the scale that is, solo. That's amazing. Yeah, I'd so love to sh- hear that. Yeah, you should check it out. I'll, po- I'll try to remember to shoot it to you after, after we record this episode. I think you got a kick Very out of cool. it. Very um, cool. Yeah, Vinnie Vincent... Um, it just didn't seem like the right fit. He was fantastic for this album, though. He was. I mean, I think he is the perfect guitarist in between, and we'll get another and one. He did, before... he did a lot of the writing on this album. He too. did. Yeah, he really did. It, it, it attests a lot to to his skills. Yeah, and Gene, uh, you know, Gene has always gone on record as saying he was the most talented member of Kiss um, in terms of guitar playing. You know, he doesn't have very many great things to say about him. I guess as a person. Um, neither him or Paul really do. I think they kind of really, you know, he really kind of um, shot himself in the foot with Kiss and, and, and other ways. But yeah, I think uh, he wanted to make it Benny Vincent's Kiss, didn't he? 
didn't he? Yeah, and then he did the what Vinnie Vincent Invasion or whatever. He had his his solo stuff in the eighties, and it's just you know hair metal shredding stuff. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a guy who stepped into an established act and really tried to put his foot down. He does in a way because again, he really writes a good chunk of this. And you know, this isn't the last album with him. We're gonna get we're gonna talk about him next episode with another Chris. Um, that oh, we, you know yeah. we'll be talking about Vinny. But again, so that's two. Yeah, he's, he's on Lick It Up as well. Isn't he, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, and he you know he puts he puts his name on that one uh, as well, credit wise. Um, but again, and he definitely stamped out their '80s sound. Oh yeah, no, I think you know he really helped. He really helped start all that. Um, uh, you know, with uh, with what you know into that '80s, especially the, coming up to the Unmasked era stuff. Um, but it's two members down, uh, two original members down, um, and and uh, two uh, two new guys in the driver's seats uh, or lead guitar player, drummer seats, so, so to speak. Um, in terms of covers, <coughs> album covers, excuse me. There are three covers. There's the original 19. I keep on my notes. I kept writing 18 something. So it says 1885 <laughs> re-release. So Kiss was way it's ahead of the time. Cover. Yeah, yeah it's steampunk cover. So the original 1885 re-release uh, with an unmasked Kiss and Bruce Kulick on the cover, who wasn't even the guitarist on the album, but was the guitarist at the time. Um, and then the third is a slight variation of the original cover. Um, yeah, there is a I cover. I found it so odd that, that none of the, the covers featured. Yeah, it's funny you say that because there is a cover that I have seen that has Ace airbrushed out and Vinny placed instead. Um, really? So, yeah. So I think there's probably like eBay, you know, album covers you can buy. Um, whenever so I used is it Vinny without the makeup? No, it's Vinny with the makeup with the Ankh makeup on. With the Ankh? Yeah. yeah. The Ankh was always kind of weird. Like I love the Fox makeup, but the Ankh never really did it for me. It was kind of a weird thing. Um, although I figured, but it was so new and it was kind of a flash in the pan, and you didn't see much of it. So it, yeah, that's true. You only really you know, see it for this watching, album. Yeah, even seeing him in old footage uh, with the makeup on it, it's kind of stark, you know. It definitely is, and I always figured like this would be Doctor Fate's favorite character in Kiss would be <laughs> Vinnie Vincent for all the right yeah. reasons, you know. Um, yeah, or maybe it just was Doctor Fate who was in the band for a while. I don't know, but again, this album brings Kiss back to its gold status again. Um, which is good news because that didn't happen. Music from the Elder, they do start touring for this album again. Um, unfortunately, um, half of the due to some half-filled arenas, they did have to start canceling some of these shows on the tour. Um, but most importantly, the band is starting to get their groove back, and um, it's something that's going to last and last here because Music from the Elder very well could have ended Kiss. Um, you know, especially it could have been their death knell. It, it, it was so horrendous. Yeah, and and you know it could have been because you know you get Ace leaving and then. Uh, you know, and he was really, you know, you look at like Ace Fraley, like his, you know, of course, Peter leaving is a bummer because anytime an original member leaves, that sucks. But Ace was like such a driving creative force in Kiss, you know, writing really some was. of the he great songs. He gave their distinctive guitar sound. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I was, um, I was really taken aback when he left the band. Yeah. So again, you know, Vinny stepping up in this, uh, Eric Carr, we'll talk about here. Eric Carr is so important to this album, drum sounding wise, because they finally let him go. They finally released his, you know, beast and he fucking hits the drums like a motherfucker. He is just a sonic boom. Yeah. He's awesome. You know, with hair on it. Um, yeah, with hair on it, of course. <laughs> um, but let's talk about it, man. Let's jump in. Let's jump right in. Um, so oh, absolutely. first track right off the bat, creatures of the night. Uh, written by Paul and Adam Mitchell, a name we're going to be hearing a lot in the upcoming episodes too, um, and sung by Paul, of course. Like I said, uh, it's it's like Kiss is trying to beat us over the head with the riff and the massive drumming in this one because they want you to forget about music from the Elder. I, the fans they had to be delighted hearing this, you know, kicking right back into it. The return of the rock sound, like we said, we're going to mention Eric Carr a lot on this because uh, pra- you know high praise is due um, in, uh, for for the, for the man himself. Um, now a guy named Mike. Uh, Por- uh, Porcaro plays uh, plays bass in this track. You might not know the name, but you know the band he's a part of. He worked in Toto, um, so oh, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was their. I, I think I don't think he was the original bassist, but he 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 was more fa- most famous for his work in Toto. Um, lead guitars by okay. An- another thing, real quick, before we get into any more lead guitar stuff, Vinnie Vincent plays on this album, and he does write a lot. But there are a handful of uh, lead guitarists on this that are more than the that are not Vinnie Vincent. One of them is yeah. Steve Ferris, um, who plays lead, lead guitar on this. Bob Kulick, brother of the almighty Bruce Kulick, who will later be we will mention in, uh, in later episodes for Kiss, um, also adds some guitar parts on this one. Um, I really dig this song, man. I love the falsetto stuff in it. I love the return to the hard rock stuff. I love oh, all of it. 
this song is, is is the rocket on the launch pad. Yeah. And it just blasts off at the beginning of the album, and it sets the tone. It does. It, it it's a it's the we're back song. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and it really uh. It really gets you going in the right direction. Yeah. As as to what to expect on the rest of the album. It also sets the tone, you know, for that whole eighties sound uh that came out of Kiss. Yeah, because um, I mean, you know, again, you know, we are in, you know, again to this isn't the first eighties album, but we are in the early stages of eighties Kiss. And also, surprise, not surprise, you know, this is their last album with, you know, the makeup uh for yeah. for a while. Um and so yeah, you're right, this is planting the seeds of what will become Lick It Up in the Unmasked era. Where they sell, you know, a lot of think a lot of people like to dismiss the unmasked stuff. Uh, you know, part of that's me included, uh, especially when I was a younger Kiss fan. And when I was originally going to do this podcast, I was only going to touch on the uh, the masked era stuff, and I would have ended at this album. But I was like, I don't really know, um, I don't really know the unmasked stuff as well. And I figured this is a perfect learning opportunity, you know, going in post uh, Creatures of the Night. But uh, but yeah, this really does kind of set up, and you know they they tour their asses off in the unmasked era, and they sell a lot of fucking albums. So they you're really right, did. You're right. This really does, and the the great I think Chris Jericho always said it too. The great thing is you can take the makeup off, you can always put it right back on, and of course they did that, you know, years later. But um, again, just a big hard rock song. Adam Mitchell does play some of the rhythm guitar on it as well. Um, so yeah, it's just it's a great statement. I think it helped. Um, it helped ease a bit of the fan worry because they had to be wondering what the hell was going on after music from the elder. And I think you, like you said, this is one to kind of help write, you know, to start right, you know, write the wrong a bit here um, and get yeah. into some great rock tracks. Um, and they, they had to start this album out strong. They did. And they, and they definitely do with this track. You know, they start off with the title track for Christ's sake. Um, so, and it, it's a great title. I think what a great title too, creatures of the night. Um, it really is. You know, you it get the, really the album cover, like their eyes kind of glow a little bit too. Like, I don't know, it's always, it's... Uh... It's fantastic. And it speaks a lot to, you know, hard rock and heavy metal fans who are always kind of outcasts. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... And we are the creatures of the night. Yeah, perfect. Perfectly summed up, man. I mean, you know, this is also an album that my brother got me into. Uh, you know, I was the one that got him the kiss. And then uh, he was the one who kind of, you know, took the ball and ran with it. And, um, you know, he was the one. So, for, so props to Mick, who was on a couple episodes... And it'll be on some later ones too, um, for really getting me into Creatures from the Night and really showing me that, uh, you know, for me back when. So anyway, um, the next track, Saint and Sinner, written by Gene and Mikhail Jap, sung by Gene. Um, so we get Gene right off the bat, which is nice. We're not right off the bat, but we get him, you know, pretty pretty early on. Um, and interesting enough, this is the only album where just Gene and Paul. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, again, sang, or the first album where just Gene and Paul. Yeah, Paul because sang. you know you get you might get backing vocals from Eric Carr and 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 maybe you know from Vinnie Vincent here or there live. But again, you're right. You know, they, Ace is no longer there, and Peter hasn't been yeah. there for a while. So yeah, it, it's it's the two of them in the driver's seat. Um, but yeah, you get solid Gene vocals. You know, I'm always a fan of mostly Gene vocals. Some of the cheesy stuff, not so much. Uh, the drumming is just again, <clears throat> excuse me, tight um, on this on this song. Um, Vinny Vincent does play lead on this one. Um, I don't know. You can just tell. Again, they're they're feeling it on this one. Uh, oh yeah, it, it, it's definitely a strong song. Um, they're not going into any new waters here. Yeah, this is your typical Gene Guttural um, song about you know sex, rock and roll. Yeah. Um, but it's it's good. It's solid. Yeah, it and, is. And I mean, it drives. And, and this is something we'll talk about as we go on, because, again, you are definitely, you know, like you said, this is one of your favorite, if not your favorite, Kiss album. I definitely love this one. I think one of the um, uh, the cons to the pro of this album for me is there are great tracks on here, and it's a great rock and roll return to it album. There's just a couple moments where I think that sonic boom that they're trying to hit you over the head with, sometimes the, the Kiss sound gets lost in it just a little bit, um, because, yeah, again, they're trying so much to write that wrong of music from the elder. I don't think Satan Sinner is necessarily one of the songs that falls under that category, but um, I think that's one re-listening to the album. I think that was one of the things where it, 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 it the word, it doesn't suffer from it, but it's, it's again, it's, it has um, so, such a massive, you know, almost, you know, just nuclear bomb sound to it that I think some of the songs um, suffer just a little bit because of again they're tr they're trying to to win back their fandom after after music from the elder. Um, and it's 
and it's funny you say that. It, it, and that's that's the sound that attracted me to it. Yeah. Um, it, it's so powerful and so driving um, throughout the entire album. Well, with the exception, I think one song. Mm-hmm. Um, that it, it is like just this side of heavy metal. Yeah, it's funny because like I've said it a million times on this and just in in general with my friends. Like to me, Kiss has never been a heavy metal band. Um, no, I think no, they've always been a hard rock band. Yeah, and I think the of course the imagery of Gene Simmons helps fuel that fire of heavy metal because he's wearing the spikes and he's spitting the blood and and the fire. Yeah, he's the demon. He's the demon. But yeah, I think this is. This might be this is, this album. I would well. There's some stuff in the '80s, like later '80s, that they get pretty close to, like especially Revenge era stuff, which I love. Um, oh, that's a strong album. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I love that album. So it's it's yeah. We'll, I mean, I'll get to that way down the line. But um, <laughs> this is one. Yeah, I think again, like I said, this so much of this album is them setting up what's going to become that sound. And like you said, like I think this album probably won over a lot of people who never listened to Kiss before. Um, it definitely did because a lot of my friends who weren't Kiss fans prior, yeah, uh, when this album came out, and I was like, "Dude, listen to this." Well, that, that, uh, that's something I wanted it, to talk. It came to new respect. That's something I wanted to talk to you about, like because like, you were there when it was all going down. Like, you know, was it something that when this album came out, there was that collective sigh of relief from like you and your 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 buddies, like yeah, they're back. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When when I first heard this album, I was like. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Well, again, that's something that you have, I think, that like I don't have as a listener because I had that instantaneous, you know, I don't have to listen to music from The Elder or I have this next album to go to. Um, yeah. Where you ha- you have that thing where, like, that I'll never have of, like, that appreciation of, oh, my God, I I had that, you know, y- eight, from 81 to 82, all I had was, you know, the new Kiss was music from The Elder. And so yeah. I think to get that, that breath of fresh air of, of, like, Creatures from the Night and I Love It Loud and stuff like that, um, with, again... With- when this album dropped, um, my friends and I were, of course, waiting for it with bated breath and worry at the same time. That's because true. Because Elders I mean, was such a disappointment. That's true because... And when it hit, we were like, wow. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's funny you mentioned the worry because, again, like Music from the Elder, they had promised a return to their rock roots and then Music from the Elder happened and they say it again and you've got to be thinking, oh, my God. You know, oh, absolutely. That's what we thought was going to happen. Yeah, Creatures of the you Night, know. it's probably some fantasy album or some, you know, are, this or that. Are they going to pull the rug out from under us again? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank God they got rid of um, the, because uh, remember Music from the Elder, they had, uh, well, no, I think Gene had it during Creatures of the Night, too, like the short hair. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> like the, with the, and then, like, Paul had the headband. I don't know. But well, they, I think they finally started to get he, it kind of back. Well, Gene had that short hair from doing um, Runaway, didn't he? Pro- yeah, he probably did. The movie? Yeah. And, then a- and it took a while for it to grow back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then Ace, you know, had his, you know, when he was still, you know, in the band with Music from the Elder, he had, like, that weird, like, onesie track suit with, like, the lightning bolt on it that looked like yeah. this, like, weird Jay Garrick kind of looking reverse suit. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so, yeah, again, it, I think so much... Reverse of- Ace. Yeah, Reverse Ace. So much, this, so much of this album, I think, is fascinating because of the context and, and, and the era that they're in and, and what came before it. Um, and what comes after it, honestly. But, um, so again, next track. Um, I don't have much to say about this one. Uh, Keep Me Coming, written by Paul uh, and, and, and uh, Adam Mitchell, again, uh, sung by Paul. We do get lead by Vinny, Vinny Vincent. Um, like I said, it's kind of a generic rock song. Um, it keeps up the loud and in-your-face mantra of Creatures of the Night. Um, but, uh, again, it's for me, there's, there's not much to say about this one. I, I don't know about you. It's very generic. It, it's uh, Paul being Paul. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a good song. It's a, again another solid entry. Yeah, uh, but doesn't make the album. Yeah, uh, it, it's probably my least favorite, if not my second least favorite track on the album. Unfortunately, both sung by Paul. Yeah, <laughs> um, it was funny. I, I, one of my things I love about revisiting all the albums is like going into. Like, you know, I hadn't listened to this album in years. And I was like, oh, I think my favorite track is this or that. And then I re-listened to it, and I had a totally different favorite track, you know, listening to it, um, which is cool. Because it's actually one, I don't know, you might be surprised by it, but we'll, we'll find out later on down the line. Um, so, yeah, 
Any any keep me coming fans out there, sorry, but we just you know just kind of like you said, kind of generic rock song. It's not it, bad, it's not but the it's star just, of the album. It's it's not. It's it's, it's filler. Yeah, it's it, good. It is, but, but it, it is it's it is good filler. filler. But it's filler. It's filler. Yeah, filler at the end is is still filler there, unfortunately. But uh, next track we got here is uh, Rock and Roll Hell, uh, which is a classic you know, classic Gene uh, uh, title written by Gene Brian Adams. Uh, that's right, Brian I Adams. Didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and and Jim Valance, who is the songwriting partner of Brian Adams. I believe we're going to hear from them. Uh, at least one more time on this album, sung by Gene. Um, uh, we get the great, you know, great riffs, great drumming again uh, by the band. The lead work is done by uh, Robin Ford. Who uh, listen to some of the people Robin Ford's worked with: Joni Mitchell, Miles Davis, and George Harrison. Um, Lord. So yeah, he's got quite the extensive career. If you go to his Wikipedia, there's there's way more. I just picked three that kind of jumped at me. Um, but yeah, Joni Mitchell, Miles da- Miles Davis, and George Harrison, and then add you know Kiss to the list. Um, I think one of the things you could say if you were... That's a heck of a spread. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things you could say about this with, like, if you're creating, like, a formula for Creatures of the Night, it's loud, big, tight, heavy drums, big, loud riffs. I love the drums at the opening of this. Oh, yeah. The big the big riffs, the bigger the better, and then the big chorus. Every song in this, even the filler, is leading to a big, meaty chorus. Oh, yeah. Uh, I like this song a lot. Um... There are two songs in here, one by uh, Gene and one by Paul, uh, where they really seem to be singing from angst and, and experience. Yeah. And uh, this song sings a little lyric-wise, autobiographical for Gene. Sure. Uh, and that's kind of why I liked it. I think his vocals on this song are really good. Yeah. Like uh, and uh, it's not, you know, it's not Satan Center. Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, you're on to something there where I think Gene and Paul feel a little revitalized on this because they got the new blood of Vinnie Vincent. They've had Eric Carr for a while now, and they know the dude's talented, and they all like him. And I think that they realize they can still write heavy rock. So there has to be a bit of that, like, that uh that moment of, like, relief for them. And I think, yeah, there are some, some moments on here, like Rock and Roll Hell uh, from Gene, where he's definitely feeling... Um, that angst and frustration growing because again they've been a band for you know in terms of re- releasing albums only almost 10 years now yeah this know? was uh yeah this was their 10 year album so you know they're getting they're getting to that point and you know 10 years you know if you look you know the beatles didn't last 10 years and stuff and that's kind of what is you know in terms of ringo at least um you know that's their you know kind of their bible at least uh you know at that and the rolling stones i would say although they kind of lost their rolling stone edge with with ace fraley um Ten yeah. years was a long time to be together as a group. It is. I mean, and it's something I've always thought about with 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 rock and roll is, and I, I'm a total hypocrite with this because, like, I'll say something like, "Oh, you know, a band sh- has a sh-, like." My thing is like a band has a shelf life, you know, and most bands don't. They just they they, they ignore that, you know. Um, yeah. Most bands like they have like the Beatles are a band. I think one of the Beatles are cons- one of the reasons the Beatles are considered so great. And iconic, aside from being kind of like the guys that busted open the door and kind of led the charge for all these other bands, was that they only were in the consciousness of America really, really for in terms of American audiences for six years. They were with Ringo for eight. But if you think about it, 64 is when they hit big on the Ed Sullivan show and they break up in 1970. So that's six years they were a band in, in America's eyes. And they released 12 albums. Yeah. Um, and so again, I think one of the reasons the Beatles, and of course, you know, you could say, Hey, the Rolling Stones are still a band. Of course. Yeah. I mean, they're iconic and fantastic and they've led the charge as well. But I think uh, one of the reasons I think the Beatles, the Beatles are seen as immortal because they were never seen as anything less than 29 year olds in this band setting, you know, which I always thought was yeah. fascinating. Um, yeah, when they, when, when they broke up, you still, I mean, whenever you, you, you thought about them, yeah. they were, they were caught in that time warp or, or that, that, that picture frame of time where they were young men still. Yeah, we never got to really see them fail. Like, they've made their missteps here and there, but the the Beatles never stayed past their welcome. Um, and they were amazing because of the amount of sound changes that they went through in their career. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's... And, it, and still were able to hold an audience, and, and that's phenomenal. Yeah, and the fact that they're not touring after a certain point, like, it's just... It's all amazing, but again, you know, so the the the, the Beatles, the, Kiss is really kind of emulating the Beatles in in so much of the you know Gene and Paul, I think, because you know, especially Gene, um, <coughs> excuse me, because you know they love the band so much. But again, um, 
so yeah, like you said, they're getting to a point now when it's like they had to be thinking like, do we want to do this anymore? We've lost two of our original members. Um, and I yeah. think Creatures of the Night, where while it might not, in terms of like critics, be critically acclaimed, say like Love Gun or Destroyer is, I think is a, an important album because it helped fuel them to give them that charge to, to, to charge into the rest of the 80s. Um, yeah, and, and I also think what, what's really important about this album is, is that when they first came out, they were trendsetters. Yeah. And then when they went through the whole dynasty and unmasked era, uh, they were just following other people's footsteps. Sure. You know, they were marble putting out anything on the shelf <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then copying everybody else hoping someone would buy it. Yeah. And and with Creatures of the Night, they became trendsetters again. Yeah. Yeah. They started uh, and doing and the, I think that they started doing the big music videos so and Yeah, yeah. I mean again, they're doing the big music videos and they're they're getting back out there, getting their faces back out there and, and taking back of uh, their own sound a little bit here. Thank God finally. Um <laughs> But yeah, again, the next track we get is uh, "Danger," the danger, danger, uh, written by Paul and Adam Mitchell. It, this is like a song that you would have like if I was in a ship that was going to self destruct or it was like running low on shields. Uh, I'd have this track playing to remind me that the shit's about to go. Um, yeah, that's your at least, red alert. Yeah, down. at least I'd be jamming the kiss. Could you imagine if the end of Alien had this instead of like the uh, you know the 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 kind of creepy uh, was it? AI voice at the end. Yeah, Ripley's running around. Yeah. Danger! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, Paul Stanley, you bitch! Um, but yeah, again, written by Paul Stanley and Adam Mitchell. Again, like I said, we're going to hear his name a lot. Sung by Paul, of course. Only one guy could do that danger falsetto Um I think, again, solid, great opening. Vinny handles the lead again on this track. Uh, Jimmy Hazlitt plays bass. He was a founding member of the fusion band Yellow Jackets, for any Yellow Jackets fans out there. Um, yep. I love Paul singing with the riff. Um that's something I think that's really cool where he sings, you know, the melody or sings along with the riff. And yeah. like I very expertly demonstrated uh, at the beginning of this, he almost sings to the point of his voice breaking, but never gets to that point, And I fucking love that in this track. I do too. Um, this is one of those songs where he's really, really on point with his vocals. Yeah. And I, I like that about the song. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, when I was talking about my two least favorite songs on the album, this is one of them. Is it? Okay. I'm always uh, curious it, when you when, when you said that. To me, it's kind of corny. Yeah. It is uh, It is a little corny, yeah. But it, it's very Paul, though. Well, I like it. You know, he's, I mean, he, does, he never gets away from this. I mean, he, he does this all throughout <laughs> the 80s. Um, I, I, and again, it, it sets a trend. Yeah. Uh, uh, he does songs like this throughout the 80s, uh, but they're good songs. Um this is, like I said, one of my least favorite um, the thi- on the album. The thing I I'm like, sorry. That, that's all. It's, it's all good, man. I think the thing I like most about this track, and again, it's not, it's not one of it's not one of my favorites, but I do like the chorus. Is that I do like the chorus. Is that Paul is experimenting, going nuts with his vocals again? You know, he's not stuck in that same old Paul Stanley thing. He's going. He's he's going back to a little bit like. Like, uh, the chorus on this sounds like something from the late 70s, you know? Like, maybe, like, Love Gun era. Like, it, yeah. again, it's, it's, he, he's, try, he's kind of going out there a little bit, um, going on the razor's edge here. And that's what I like. Well, oh, I give him credit for, for, you know, getting out on that cliff with this song, because he yeah. definitely did. But I think you definitely hit the nail on the head that it is super cheesy. It is, a, it is kind of a cheese song, you know? Um, yeah. You know, for, but he, fun. Yeah and, he, <laughs> and, yeah, and he wrote a song called Keep Me Coming earlier, and this is the cheesiest one out of the two so far. So what does that say? <laughs> But um, and that sounds like you th- you figure that would be a Gene song for sure. But uh, leave keep it to, me coming. Yeah, yeah. Leave it to Paul. Absolutely. Though. Leave it to yeah, Paul, especially after that video. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, the next, I went there. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> the uh, the next track though, the next track is the big is one of the big one. I would say, and 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 tell me if tell me if I'm wrong on this. Um, the track is "I Love It Loud," written by Gene and Vinny. So you get Vinny writing on what I would like again. I think this is yep. the most well-known track in the album. So I don't know if you agree with me on that, but I think it is. Um, it absolutely is. Okay, good, good stuff. Uh, I remember when this video dropped on MTV. Oh yeah, the video is great. And I, I was blown away. Yeah, uh, it was Kiss doing anthems again. Yeah, exactly. You know, and they hadn't done. A successful anthem in a long time. No, they ha- they haven't. Um, but yeah, you know. So and it's, it's so strong with the yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's just the, it's hard driving, and it's everything you want from a Kiss song. It, yeah, you're right. I mean, again, they're doing the anthem again. They're doing it big. I love it loud is the perfect mantra for Creatures of the Night. 
Um, and it's a perfect mantra for Gene. It if is. It's too loud, you're too old, Gene. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's a great track, great live staple. It's exactly what the title suggests, louder in your face. I will say, one of the most Gene lines of all time is two-fisted until the very end. That's one of the most Absolutely. Gene lines. Two-fisted until the very end. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then Eric's Eric stays on the his head back and forth. Yeah, yeah. But one of the things I love about that line though is Eric, as he like, he stays on the snare on that uh, for the for the you know the 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 full count as opposed to just yeah. the one and the three. He stays on it for like the you know the two and the he go he he does he he again he's got like a proggy not like super proggy but like he's he's so much different than Peter in that he's experimenting. He takes chances with the drums and you know just little things like that. I like you know he's adding the double kick. He's keeping on the snare. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, well, he's younger. He's younger than Peter. That's uh, true. He's got yeah. a lot. He's got a lot of fire in him. Yeah. And he definitely, every time he played, he was out to prove something. Oh sure. Well, again, I th- you know that was something that was in the back of his mind. It had to be. You know, he's the guy. You know, he's he's the guy taking over for Peter Chris in a band that he loved, like you know, like us. You know, yeah. it'd be like so if he's one of got us to be better. Yeah, or as good. Yeah, and I think that you know, yeah. again, his his great thing is that he it was he wasn't he, the best thing that he brought. Aside from just his personality and, and, and being a guy that everyone seemed to love, was that and his he, awesome hair? Yeah, it was all oh, fantastic hair. Is that he wasn't Peter Chris, and I mean it in the sense that he didn't play like Peter Chris, and Not so at all. It, it, it it gave a new sound to like hearing Detroit Rock City with his drumming. It was a totally different song, you know. Yes, it, I mean it was even more hard rock, and that song is already I think one of the greatest rock songs ever written. Um, yeah. So again, I'm glad you touched on that that music video. If you guys haven't seen it, check it out. It is classic '80s. Music video it's so cool. with with the intro. Well, and speaking and... of cheese, it's a it's a cheesy '80s video. Oh yeah, <clears throat> but it's really cool because I mean they do that glowy eye thing like they did on the cover, That's and right. and it's just it's uh, it opens up on a family you know eating yeah. dinner and it's just it's 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 every '80s video. Yeah, yeah, you know with the straight laced family and then. Here comes a big rock band coming to destroy their yeah, world. What was <laughs> what was up with like that '80s thing that was like all the bands played in people's houses? Like I remember, uh, I don't know. I mean, everyone did it from from Kiss to Rat, <laughs> Twisted Sister, and then like uh, yeah, the, uh, Queen did it with the Invisible Man, where like Freddie Mercury like shows up in the yeah. house, and they're just like in this family's house. I don't know what it was with like rock bands showing up in the '80s in people's houses, but I guess that was a thing. I think that they were all secretly home invaders, and they were trying to tell us that without actually coming <laughs> yes. out to admit it. <laughs> I guess, you don't want to do any jail time. I guess it so. Psychological. It's all it's it's all psychological in the end, man. Um, but yeah, again, it's it's like I said, I think it's the biggest the biggest song on the album uh, for multiple reasons, um, and, and definitely the most well known, even over the title track. Um, so yeah, it's it's big time, man. I think if you had to sum up "Creatures of the Night," and I'm pretty sure I've called it "Creatures from the Night" like five times already. Um, "Creatures of the Night" is this song, you know, I think this sums up everything that they wanted to do. The mission statement, I think, for Creatures of the Night was was I love it. Loud. It does. It's an incredible song. However, it's not my favorite song on the album. So we haven't got we haven't got to your favorite yet. No, I have an idea, and I'll let you know if if, if it is. I think get you to know it. which one it is. I I might shock you though. The next track is my favorite track on the album. Um, I still love you. I still love you. It's a phenomenal. It's song. so good, man. It's it is. <laughs> It is like I said. This is a trend-setting album. This is the first, and I'm going to go on record as saying this, and I don't care if I'm wrong or not. <laughs> this is the first he- heavy metal or hard rock power ballad. Yeah, I mean, it is. It really is. Like it's before and, and Motley Crue and all and, those. And the and... vocals from Paul are just my God. It may, they make you want to cry. Oh yeah, I mean it's uh, you know? it's. It's the fucking shit, man. It's again. It's written by Paul and Vinny. So again, Vinny is putting his fucking you know hand to the fire in this shit because he's done. I love it loud, cred. And now he's got cred on. I still love you. Sung by Paul, like you said. I think maybe, maybe his best vocal track, uh, if not of all time. You know, one of the top three. I mean, he sells I, this I track. Agree. Um, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. You know, again, it's the ballad, like you said. It, it very well could be. Uh, I'll back you on that. You know, the first power, you know, first real big power album, at least in the 80s, you know. Yeah. Um, Robin Ford returns for the lead on this one. Um, it's got a sinister vibe to it. And I love it. You know, like Paul's, like, I don't know, like you said, maybe it's autobiography. You know, he's got some of the autobiography stuff going on there. Um, but the song is just on the verge of exploding. Um, yeah. And then when it finally does explode, it's just the best. Um, everybody he brings. Feels- 
song. Yeah, every, he makes you feel it. Everybody brings on this track, you know, of course, Eric and everybody. But, yeah, Paul is the stand-on in this song, without a doubt. Like, yeah, this is the one that, like, going into it when I was younger, I was like, oh, yeah, I love it loud. Or, you know, it's probably my favorite track. No, I Still Love You is definitely my favorite uh, off this, this album. It is it's, my second favorite track on the album. It is so damn good. Then I'm almost positive I know what your favorite is. But, like, yeah, it's, it is just astoundingly good. Um, if you guys haven't heard it or you weren't familiar with it, uh, check it out. Even if, if if there's one track, like even the, the other stuff you love on here, just yeah. listen to this one because you'll be amazed at like Paul's Paul's vocals. It's on very this. haunting. It is. It is. It, like I said, it's got a sinister, haunting quality to it. It's just it's so damn good. Um, so I still love you. My definitely. You know, I'll, I'll, you know that's my. Favorite. I love you too, man. Oh, thanks, man. Um, <laughs> it's, it's it's definitely my favorite favorite track in the album. Um, because man, when Kiss writes a ballad, they, you know they they know what they're doing and they and they bring it. They on the really song. do. They've always been fantastic. They have, you know. Um, Hard Luck Woman is one of my favorite just Kiss songs in general. Um, oh yeah, but uh, so good. It's it's the it's it's astounding. But yeah, Killer is the next track on here, um, written by Gene and Vinny. So Vinny with the one, two, three punch, three punch. I guess. Yeah, he just uh, is a writing fool on right? the album. Yeah, I mean that's I mean, for being the new guy. Yeah, the new guy, and he comes it's in here. I'm gonna help you write three tracks. Sung by Gene. Um, I love Gene's wild vocals on this track. Um, Vinny again is back on lead on this one. Um, you've heard it once, you've heard it twice, you've heard it seven, eight times already. Solid riffs, big time riffs on this one. Um, there are some really cool thrashy elements. Again, you know, like you said, we wouldn't consider them a heavy metal band, but there's some pretty cool thrashy uh, riffs on here or thrashy elements, which I think is pretty exciting. I think that comes from Vinny, and I think that comes from Eric Carr uh, mostly. Um, but again, a, a great kind of Gene track uh, in general. And another song that you know that you know reaches out to hard rock and heavy metal fans, yeah. you know, killers, we're stone cold, ki- you know, yeah. it, it just, yeah. it's, it's just under being an anthem. Yeah. But it, it and it's very powerful. Um, I like it. I've, I've always liked that song. Um, yeah. my favorite song on the album. No, but I've always liked it. Well, we're going to jump right <laughs> to what I know is your favorite album. Well, um, it's the process of elimination. Yeah. Well, if it wasn't that, just knowing you're a comic fan, I just figured you'd like this track just because of the title. But um, well, no, you know, War Machine wasn't a character then. Yeah, that's true. Um, but just in general, I feel like you would just be like just the osmosis of War Machine. But it is a fucking kick-ass track. It's the closing track. It's written by Gene, written by Adams and Valance against Ryan Adams and his, and his writing partner. Um, sung by Gene. It's got everything. It's got the big riffs. It's got the big drums. It's got the big vocals. I think it's Gene's best track on the album. I'm pretty sure you'd agree with me. Um, I, I 100% agree with you. Vinny takes lead on this one. It's it's fucking, it's huge, man. It's awesome. This was my WWF entrance song. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, oh yeah. I'm coming down that ramp. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I want War Machine it's playing. It's such a great riff, man. It's, it's, it's very powerful, and it's the closest metal song on the entire album. It is, yeah. Like, again, this is one where, like, if, if we're ever going to jump ship and say that they're a metal band, it's War Machine is the one you're going to put in there. Um, it's funny. All, all I can think about now is, like, the lights going down and, like, Verizon Center and, like, the... Da, na, 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 and then it just says... It just, ste- you know, smoke comes up and you come walking out slowly in the leather jacket. Da, na, 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 na. Yeah, you get in the ring and get yeah. slaughtered. <laughs> yeah, just get your ass kicked. But at least you came Boy, out to... Boy, that jobber had an awesome entrance. Yeah, yeah, song. yeah. At least you came out to War Machine. You might have got your ass kicked by Stone Cold Steve Austin, but at least you came out to War Machine. Such a great song, though. It is. It's. It is. You know, I'm gonna bite the hand that feeds me. I'm gonna turn the tide. I'm gonna set the demons free and watch them fly. I yeah. mean, come on. If you're, I mean, <laughs> if you're gonna start the album called Creatures of the Night with Creatures of the Night, and you want to get that in your face just right off the bat, you want to end with War Machine. And yeah, you've got to have. If you're gonna start that strong, you've got to end that strong. Yeah, yeah. And and they do it, which is why this album is so good. I think um, so. Yeah, it's. It's you know it's it's one of those things and I've said I'll I've, I'll say it every probably every episode but it's one of those things where it's so much fun to re-listen to it um, because again like I hadn't listened or I hadn't thought about I still love you in so long you know that was one that kind of just slipped under the radar and I listened to it again you're like holy shit um, yeah but then of course you know and I rem- it's one of those songs where if you hear it once you want to hear it again oh yeah I mean yeah I I was like yeah it's cool killer and I and I knew War Machine you know I'd listen to that one over and over again you know when I was a younger kid because it was just so heavy. 
But uh, I still love you. Like when I was a younger Kiss fan, I didn't want any ballads, no ballads. I didn't care about anything. So you know, but uh, <laughs> no one wanted ballads. No, get out of here with the ballads. But ah, you know, that sappy love stuff. That's right. Yeah, I'm 30 now, so I still love you is like the Kiss stuff I listen to. But no, it's it, but I mean that track's just it's so good, you know, and and it shows their it shows their dynamic music ability. I think. Um, but yeah, so basically, you know, here's an album. The main thing that we get is it gets them back to their roots. I think it settles Kiss fans in a, a little bit, uh, tucks them into to bed a little bit uh, neater here, uh, getting ready for the rest of the '80s, whatever that just means. But um, and, and it and it and it certainly sets the tone. You're right, exactly. It's uh, it, for everything that comes after this in the '80s. It sets the tone. I think. Uh, in the in one hundred percent the best way possible, and some of like the more filler stuff obviously is going to find its way in there. But those big anthems, we're going to hear the big anthems again. Um, you know, we're going to hear those songs that yeah. were written for stadium arena rock stuff because they go on huge tours again. Kiss oh, you know, yeah. at this time, Kiss. Like I said, it's insane to, to think about. You know, even nowadays, because you know you see them live and they're just massive. But you know, at this point in their career, like they had to cancel gigs because they were half filled arenas. Um, and I yeah. think this this album is where they're going to start to get that groove back, and they're going to start. And their next album is a fucking ginormous success. Um, oh. and, it, and, it, and it's not because they just. It's not just because they take the makeup off. Yeah, I, I remember uh, sitting down uh, for them to take their makeup off and watching that happen. Oh, on MTV, it was right? Pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it was pretty phenomenal. Because I mean, that, that you know, this is back then again. You know, that's one of the great things I love talking about it because you were there for all that stuff. And like you said, like there wasn't like the internet to look up what Ace and Peter and all those guys looked like. It was just there wasn't, and they did such a good job of hiding who they were. Yeah, uh, I, to the public, that yeah, people really didn't know. I remember seeing photos in like biographies and stuff of them where like they would cover their face or they'd use like a magazine and like they'd yeah. really go out of the way to cover their faces. Magazine, piece of paper, yeah. you know, doctor's mask. Yeah. Anything to cover their face. And they and they kept that up for so many years. It, it, it really surprises me. I mean, you know, they did the, the whole Superman secret ID thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and pulled it off. Yeah. Um, and when they took the makeup off, I, I think there was a collective uh, gasp. Oh, my God, they really did it. Yeah, and I think uh, that's something where, you know, of course, you know, even if they, don't, they say it's not, of course there's a gimmick quality to taking it off. And I don't think that's a bad word, but I think it's... It, oh, it certainly was. It definitely was you know, a gimmick. They were moving into a, 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 new, a new decade of music, and, and, and you know, they had just finished a successful album with Creatures, and, they, and, and I think they wanted to present themselves differently to the world. Yeah, uh, and, and I think it helped, again, breathe them a sigh of relief that they could just play. They could play without makeup. They could, they, you know, they didn't yes. have to worry about. It. They could just be a rock band, and that was yeah. They didn't have to uh, to keep the makeup on to be good. Which, oddly enough, um, if you look at Mudvayne, yeah, uh, I think that they performed better with the makeup. Oh yeah, than without. Interesting. I don't know if you're a Mudvayne fan at all. I, I don't know much but, of their stuff. <laughs> stuff to be well, honest. Well, if, if you if you if you if you check them out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, Watch them watch a, a song live with their makeup on, and watch that same song live without the makeup. Okay. Um, it was almost like he could hide behind that uh, persona that he created him for himself, the singer. Interesting. Um, and he could be somebody else, uh, and he was a much more powerful singer. Cool. Uh, which is really neat, you know. Yeah. I couldn't see Alice Cooper performing without makeup. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's it's 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 got to be a mind fuck for them, you know, for these performers who do it, like you know, Slipknot and and you know, Daft Punk. I mean, you know, they went, you know, a couple of years of you know just being normal guys, and they put the robot stuff on, and then it just you know became something totally different. Um, yeah, and then, you know, they you take the makeup off, you come out, you're exposed. I bet they felt naked playing. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, Paul and Gene talking about it in their book, and they definitely talked about it feeling, you know, pretty weird. But it also felt really good, probably too, for them. So, wow. but uh, well, back to creatures. This album, you're right, it reassured fans that they still had that fire. Yeah, uh, that we were afraid was dwindling. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, I think we do need to make mention that this album was uh, dedicated to Neil Bogart. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Who died of cancer while they were recording it. That's so. right. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I mean, the guy who's been in their corner since, since you know, day one, really. And uh, you're right, you know, dedicating to him because he was a huge part of the Kiss family. And a huge he part was. of I mean, it. I remember all my early Kiss albums had, you know, the Bogart label on it. That's right. So, um, yeah, man, you know, on that note, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an album that's, you know, 
it's 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 certainly important to the Kiss timeline <clears throat> because you know like you said it sets up the the rest of the '80s for them. Uh, it's the last album with the makeup until the reunion stuff in '96. You know, so uh, you know, 14 years later. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's again, Chris. It's always a pleasure talking to you, man. Uh, oh, absolutely! I, I loved having you on for these two episodes. Uh, I'll put wanted a, to give you a little uh, a little info on tripping over reality. Yes, yes, uh, I was going to say, I, please. I just cut a deal with a uh, pretty major comic book company. Yes, excellent. Uh, who's starting a creator-owned imprint, and they'll be distributing my books. Oh, excellent. So that'll be growing. Yeah, Look man. Out. No, tripping I, over reality. Amazon.com right now. Later on, somebody else, and I'll let you know later. Awesome, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna again. I'm gonna put the links up uh, in the description here when we post it. Um, but as always, man, thank you so much. For, again, thank you so much, mostly for taking that that music from the Elder episode because I knew that wasn't an easy one to sell. Um, it was fun. It was. It fun. was though. It, it was. I knew. I knew it would be fun though. But yeah, it's it's it. You know, it means you have to listen to the whole album again. But. Um, <laughs> Creatures of the Night, you know, I knew I was excited to get you on because I knew how much you love this album, and it, it shows talking to you about it, man. So, uh, well, like, I, I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Uh, and anytime you need uh, you need a guest host or, or hell, you know, maybe call me every once in a while. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I'll see you at a con. I see you at a con or something too. But yeah, I'll definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're in the. Uh, you'll be in the uh, the Rolodex or whatever for for if I ever need you for you know for a, uh, a future episode, man. Very good. Thank you. No problem, man. For everything. All right, guys. Everyone, again, that was Creatures of the Night. We're going to be going in next week with another Chris talking all about Lick It Up. I've been Jake. Chris Schwartzlander, thank you so much, and have a great night, rock and roll night, and party every day. Goodbye. Peace. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a new commentary every Monday. We've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.